This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 17, recorded on September 30th, 2011. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from the Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, Vincent. It's good to be with you again. After seeing you in person, we're back on the airwaves. Chicago is always great. It's always nice to go home and uh, walk around the city I haven't lived in in 30 years. But uh, Oh, really? You're from Chicago, huh? I, I grew up in Chicago, it, literally in the city. And oh. uh, so it's, it's always interesting to see how the place has changed. And people ask me about restaurants, and I have no clue. <laughs> I haven't lived there in 30 years, and the only restaurant I know with consistency in Chicago is the one that started there, and that's McDonald's. Oh, boy. <laughs> They're consistent. <laughs> Although calling it a restaurant may be a stretch. Nah. That voice you hear is our other guest today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Welcome, Elio. Well, thank you. I must say, I listened to your podcast from Chicago with great envy. You guys really had a good time. We did. You had fabulous people on board, and you discussed two amazing subjects antibiotic resistance, and the idea of why is it that if we are, this, this is a world full of fungi, why is it that fungal infections are relatively rare? And you had Arturo Casadeval from Albert Einstein, who has magnificent thoughts on the subject. Yeah, it was great. I learned a lot. Nice. Yeah. He also gave a talk there, and I went to that mm. as well. And I think we have to get him on TWIM. Oh, Again, it's some time to expound, expand on what he was talking about. It was a lot of fun. He sort of didn't know what to make of us at the beginning, but once he got into the groove, <laughs> he got into the groove. Yeah, I think it all it all went well. I think uh, David Livermore and Stu Levy all did well, and we had a good time in the audience. Well, the room was packed. It was just great. I was very happy. And so because of that nice experience, it's uh, it's likely that we'll be back at – some meeting or other, and maybe maybe even a GM, and you can you can join us, Elio, when we're there. Oh, great! Love to. That would be fun. Then I get to meet you, actually. Yeah, we never met in the flesh. That'd be lovely. Okay, so that's that was fun, but we did miss you today. Of course, we have two papers that we're going to talk about, and um, actually, for once, they're in a pretty close subject. Usually, we're all over the place. Today, today they all have to do with. Uh, symbiotic relationships, um, and the first one, I think, I think Elio, you had pointed out to me uh, some some time ago. This paper on nested symbiosis in mealybugs. How did you come across that? <laughs> Actually, I don't remember, but uh, the author. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's not that long ago. It's not that long ago, but I ran into a paper by uh, an entomologist, essentially Carol Van Dolen. Uh, who uh, described an amazing thing, that inside of mealybugs, and I'll tell you what mealybugs are if you don't know, uh, inside of them are endosymbiotic, endosymbiotic bacteria, which is something very common among the insects, but these have a specialty which is, I think, so far unique. Inside the bacteria are bacterial symbionts. In other words, a bacterium inside a bacterium inside of an insect. A bug in a bug in a bug. Hmm. Okay, if you let me use that. And this seemed to me so extraordinary, and it had been followed up uh, that I could tell, but recently a paper by Van Dolen, uh, the paper discussed by Van Dolen, and McCutcheon came out. McCutcheon is a uh, endosymbioticist of insects. He worked with Nancy Moran, who's one of the leading lights in that field. And this paper goes on to tell us more about this relationship. So this is a very this is a, a paper in current biology, and the authors are, as you say, McCutcheon and Von Dolan. They are in two different places, right? Right. 
and one is a specialist in uh, symbionts of insects, you said? Yeah. And the other is... Well, the other has worked in the field, but she's basically an entomologist. An entomologist. So... Yeah. And there's just the two of them. I, I presume they're both PIs, and there's no oh, yeah. one. There's no one else on this paper. No students. No postdocs. Mm. So these two just got together and said, "Hey, I have this cool symbiosis. Let's work on it." Do you think? I suppose That's, yeah, this I, is like the, like in the old days or something. Yeah, where you don't uh, need twenty authors on a paper, and this is a beautiful paper. So it shows you it can be done. I think it's great because nowadays papers have tons of authors. And here you had two PIs who had an idea, and they just did the experiments. Right. I think that's really well, not to play on words, it's it's sort of a symbiotic relationship <laughs> yeah. between between the two. And if if you really get into the science here, it's almost um, high risk science for uh, graduate students' work because what they found was truly remarkable, and it could be viewed as high risk from a graduate student's perspective because you don't know what you're going to get out of investigating something as cleverly as they went after. I suppose. But yeah. the high-risk stuff is the big payoff. Right. Oh, yeah. Uh, do you suppose we should introduce the subject in general? About Absolutely. Endo sure. Okay. Let me say something about endosymbiosis, bacterial endosymbionts in insects. Uh, first of all, insects and bacteria and fungi have close communication. They talk to each other all the time in various ways. When it comes to bacteria, uh, not all symbionts are endo. There are some which are ectosymbionts and are very important. But we're going to talk today only about endosymbionts. And by and large, over 10, 20% of all insects have them. Hmm. And they tend to carry them in different parts of their body sometimes inside of specialized cells. The specialized cells are called bacteriocytes, are usually found in the gut. But some, some endosymbionts are found inside the tips or the, the tissue of the antennae, the ovaries, and so forth. And they, um, so they're there for a reason. And the reasons are many. Uh, the one we're going to talk about today is nutritional. It's providing their host with needed nutrients, but some in some cases they have to do with defenses, in some cases, as in the second paper we're going to discuss, it has to do with evolution and uh, procreation. So endosymbionts are there in large numbers. Uh, they are in some groups amazingly frequent. For instance, in the aphids and other insects that suck sap from plants, uh, probably the majority have them, 80%, 60%, 80%, something like that, of all aphids, all uh, mealybugs and so forth have this kind of stuff. So uh, there are a couple of remarkable things that need to be said. First of all, most of these endosymbionts have reduced genomes. The genomes go from, oh, half a million bases to down to probably the smallest known, which is part of this paper, which is 130 KB. That is small. Mm. And right away, right away, you can ask a question, what makes these bacteria? Why are they not called organelles? Yep. Right? I mean, after all, this is the mitochondria and some mitochondria and certainly some chloroplasts have, the, have genomes which are bigger than that. Most, yep. most don't, but some chloroplasts have really a lot of DNA. And none of so, these can be cultured, right? And none of these can be cultured. There's a very good reason they can't be cultured because there's no way they could ever make it. Mm. They lack too many genes and too many functions. They can't even make proteins, right? Well, yeah, they do. No, no, they, they do make proteins, but they do it in funny ways. And actually, that's a subject about which not enough is known. Mm -hmm. The reason I say that is because they do have most, but not all, ribosomal proteins. Mm -hmm. And some, like the one we're going to talk about today, lacks uh, tRNA synthetases or completely. So how does it get its yeah. tRNA? So they must have helped, right? They must have helped. That's mm -hmm. the idea, because there's, there's something that is weird. So th this is... Genomicists have a field day with this because this reduced genome stuff goes a long way towards thinking about evolution. The idea is that at one time these were complete bacteria and then they, they came into a host and started losing genes. Is that uh, it? 
Well, what else? You know, well, that, that's what we think about mitochondria and chloroplasts. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, this is the, the, only, <laughs> the only way you can think of making them. I mean, I don't think you can make a bug inside of a host from scratch. Right. That would be, that would be a creation act. <laughs> it seems a little bit distant. So the idea is that this is re genomic reduction from something that was capable of independent life. At one point. So let me, let, since we're in the provocative piece before we get into the meat of the paper, let me ask this question. Could, could you almost view the human genome as being a redu reduced genome in the sense that we have all of our symbiotes providing to us in a manner very similar to this? And considering how complex the microbiome is of of people and the things that go on with us, we have all this interactions. And I think the paper that we're about to go through is, is, is actually a primer in how, if you're interested in this field of, you know, how different genomes interact, this is again, very similar to Margaret's story with um, communications and her squid. This is another story where you have complex genome interactions amongst microbes actually interacting with a higher multicellular life form. Well, that's a very good point because in reality, you think about the reduction of the genome by the symbiont and not by the host, and you're right. If a symbiont provides certain functions, the host loses them. And I think mitochondria are a great example. Yes. No, that's, that's, we, we don't have some genes uh, required for oxidative phosphorylation and oxidative metabolism, which certainly our ancestor organisms did have before they swallowed another organism that became a mitochondrion. So, yeah, I think whenever you acquire, so this is, it becomes a, a, a game of allotting functions, not just to one cell or one genome, but to a couple. And this is formidable stuff. We, we have to really understand this a little bit better. And what Michael said adds another dimension. Besides the symbionts, mitochondria, let's say, or the symbionts of insects, we also have our gut flora, which is an organ and which provides us with lots of things which we don't make anymore, like vitamin K and choline. So those things are functions that I'm sure our ancestor organisms had and lost. So it's a two-way street when, uh, like, if you, if you can let somebody else do it, you don't have to do it yourself. Okay. So what's a mealybug? What's a mealybug? <laughs> a mealybug is a little bug that grows on plants and is a pest. It's a garden <laughs> pest of some significance. It's called a mealybug because it's covered with a little powder. That's, it's, it's not that it grows on meal, but it looks like it's covered with a little bit of um, okay. powder. Yeah. Anyhow, they are um, insects which carry this, this two, this, this nested symbionts, this endosymbionts. And the story here is similar in a way to that of other insects like aphids or the glassy wing sharpshooter. Which is these insects have uh, entomologists have a good time. I mean they really have interesting names for things. Anyhow, in the in the in this case we're talking really about a class of endosymbionts for insects that grow on sap, on phloem sap. Now the sap of most plants, and these are herbaceous plants, these are sort of garden variety plants, uh, are rich in sugars, but poor in amino acids. So insects are like us. We can make about 10 of our amino acids. The other 10 are called essential, right? Well, insects are about the same thing. They call, many of these can make about 10 amino acids, but they cannot make the other 10. So where do they get them? They can't get them from their nutrients. And sure enough, it's the endosymbiotic bacteria that make the other 10. So both the insects and the bacteria can count to 10. Okay. <laughs> One counts 10 amino acids, the other one counts the other 10 amino acids. And that's, that's really the story. But it gets a little bit more interesting, a little bit more complicated, because um, in many insects, there's more than one endosymbiont. Uh, for instance, in aphids, there's a thing called Buchner, which is a, after Buchner, who was the pioneer in this field, and Buchner are very common, and they are in all 
uh, involved in amino acid uh, production plus other things. So the story is that in some uh, aphids, in some uh, sharpshooters, there is more than one bug, but they are side by side. They're not one nested inside the other, which is what we're talking about here in the mealy bugs. So here's the story. It was usually, in most cases, you have it so that if there are two endosymbionts, one provides the insect with certain amino acids or fatty acids or uh, coenzyme A or stuff like that. Other, the other symbiont provides it with the others. That's simple enough. Bug A produces certain needed nutrients for the insects. Bug B produces another set. However, in some cases, like in aphids, it's known that uh, the uh, Buchnera uh, makes some precursors for, let's say, tryptophan synthesis, and the Serratia makes the others. Hmm. So it's kind of weird. Uh, neither can make tryptophan all on their own. So Bugnera makes essentially a couple of early steps. It makes anthelanitic acid. The anthelanitic acid somehow is taken up by the serratia and it continues the steps. It makes the rest of the intermediates leading to the synthesis of tryptophan. It's a little bit mysterious. You know, how does this happen? Well, they're in proximity, I guess, and so there's enough uh, proximity so that one feeds the other the proper intermediate. Now, in the clay, in the case of what we're talking about today, in the paper today, it, this is carried to an extreme. In the uh, uh, mealybug, one of the bacteria is smaller than the other, okay? Uh, the one that is uh, larger is called uh, Tremblea. I don't know who that's called for, but uh, just to give it a name, and it's a beta proteobacterium. So it's nothing extraordinary in terms of its evolution. It's, some, it's part of the microbial bacterial tree, gram negative looking, at least by uh, morphology. It has a double membrane and so forth. And it has a very tiny genome, 139 KB. Inside it is a gamma proteobacterium, not beta, but gamma. And this one is, has a new name. It's called Moranella. And I want to take a second to say why it's called that. Because it's named after Nancy Moran, who's now at Yale, and who is one of the leading lights in this, in this subject. So it's very appropriate that we have a Moranella now. Moranella is the one inside the Tremblea. Okay? It's a small one. And in fact, the, the Tremblea is huge. It's 10 to 20 microns across. Great big thing. The Moranella, Moranella is regular size, maybe a micron or so. Now, the Moranella has a much bigger genome, about four times bigger than its host. Let's call it a host. The host meaning the Tremblea. The Tremblea, the big one. So the big one has a small genome. This, the one inside of it has a big genome, and I think this is sort of genomic chutzpah. <laughs> I love well, that. <laughs> the, the question that I had is, is Tremblea an organelle on the wrong side of the membrane because Tremblea is bigger. So is it an organelle that didn't figure out how to get small to live inside Moranella? Or no, no, is Moranella it simply... Lives inside of it. No, wait. Moranella, no, Moranella is lives inside, inside Tremblea, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Because Tremblea is 10 to 20 microns wide and Moranella, Moranella lives inside Tremblea. Right. right. And so, uh, but Tre Moranella's genome is larger than Tremblea's. Yeah, right. So the question I have is, is Tremblea the organelle for Moranella? Well, let me say why this, is, why this makes a lot of sense. Because if you look at cockroaches, you're going to find that they have mitochondria, which are huge, and inside of them you find bacterial endosymbionts. That's right. So you can say... The, uh, the tremblea, the big one, is the equivalent of the mitochondria and cockroaches. Uh, I think this is, this is a problem, and this is something that becomes partly semantic. First of all, I don't think that the, all this stuff leads to the conclusion that there may not be a sharp distinction between organelles and endosymbionts, reduced genome endosymbionts. There may be a spectrum and it may be simply that we cannot make that distinction very easily. However, right now, I believe, and I haven't really seen much writing about this, I believe that the distinction is the following. Mitochondria look like mitochondria. The endosymbionts look like bacteria. Okay, in other words, on a thin section, 
What you yeah. see is so characteristic of mitochondria. They are decreased. Uh, you know, they, they look very different. Even though they were once bacteria, seems to be no doubt of that, but now they look like something special. Whereas the endosymbionts, they, they, some, actually some are look like funny bacteria. Like they tend to be quite big usually, but they have, they look more like bacteria than anything else. Mm -hmm. So that's about the level and on what the discussion is. So let's be careful about not being stuck and saying on the one side of a divide are organelles, on the other side are endosymbionts. That is probably wrong, and I think that wall is going to come down. Yeah. The other interesting thing that I was thinking about when I was reading about Tremblea is whether or not this is nothing more than uh, a barren cell division in which a plasmid acquired an origin of replication. So you, you have a plasmid that then began to figure out how to replicate itself and got a sufficient origin of replication that allowed it to segregate um, the now chromosome so that it could effectively be partitioned and propagated. Mm -hmm. And the reason you can't grow them on Petri plates, even if we knew the right type of medium to, to cultivate them on, is that they're missing some essential functions that they're getting from Morinella. And consequently, it, it can't get be done. Oh boy, so, you're, you're on a roll. You may be right. I mean, this is this is possible. There's no indication of that. I mean, plasmids, uh, some mega plasmids, look like chromosomes almost. Although generally they have different functions than the chromosomes. But that that may be. I don't think there is anything that says otherwise at this point. Uh, however, I think the easier interpretation right now, and the one that I would go with tentatively is that these are used to be bacteria they got eaten up when they got eaten up they reduced the genome they lost most functions and they retained some it could be that these are still in the process of being reduced right and oh maybe, yeah maybe it's, maybe it's an intermediate because if you look at the the animal mitochondrial genome it's even smaller. It's 16 That's KB right. with, with 37 genes. So maybe we're looking at the reduction in, in real time. And there is, there is a reason to think so because uh, Moranella has 19 pseudogenes. What yeah. are they doing? Yeah. You know? yeah. So uh, that may be that they're still changing. Elio, within this, um, this, these bacteria are within the uh, bacteria site, right? Yeah. And where is that in the aphid? In the, in the gut. It's in the gut. The specialized cells on the wall of the gut, in the mid-gut, I believe. All right, so that's why they're endosymbiotes, because they are within the bacteria. They're inside the Yeah, and by the way, if you ever look at the picture of a bacteriocyte, it's absolutely magnificent. It is, you find in the middle a nucleus, and the rest is bacteria. <laughs> I mean, this is amazing. It's wall-to-wall -wall bacteria. Just like you find in a root nodule of a, of a legume, you find that it's wall-to-wall -wall bacteroids, a kind of rhizobium modification that goes into that kind of symbiosis. So it is absolutely mm -hmm. packed. There's no room for anything else there. I don't think there's a mitochondria, room for a mitochondria in, this, in those bacteriocytes. Mm. And if you look at a mealybug on a plant, it, it sort of looks like a root nodule. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's bumpy good. and you yeah, right. don't tell the bug that you know don't no. <laughs> well w one other really interesting thing about you know thinking about our friends in synthetic biology you know this really is is giving them a valuable lesson if you're trying to make uh, complex synthetic drugs for making some of these schizophrenic looking antibiotics that are you know, that have these really complex organic structures. If if you could get a genetic system where Morinella and Tremblea could um, be manipulated at a, at a genetic level so that you could put in genes of choice, 139 KAB is much easier to manipulate than the four megabases of good old E. coli. Mm. And so I think, I think the synthetic biologist should really pay attention to these endosymbiotes because they could teach them many valuable lessons about delivering precursor molecules to the right synthetic location and figuring out how to put sets of genes in one bacterium and the other sets of genes in the other and then feeding in crosstalk in order to get the right chirally active molecules. Mm. And if you 
think about what's going on in some of the streptomyces of how they make antibiotics, it's it's really pretty remarkable how they are able to synthesize this complex chemistry. But since we're not as smart as the bacteria, especially the streptomyces, these these endosymbionts may teach the synthetic biologists how to do it, albeit on a small scale. Michael, if you if you synthesize this uh, Tremblaya genome, which is a hundred forty thousand bases, you could do that. Yeah, and you put it in. I don't know E. coli. Would anything happen? <laughs> oh boy! I, I, you know the. the you know, I, as I was reading this, and I, uh, I, I'm giving my genetic lectures to the medical class this year, and so I, I was going through this, and I, I was reading this cutting-edge paper while at the same time trying to go back to the very basic roots of uh, bacterial genetics of what the modern medical student should think about, and I'm going, they really need to hear about this new stuff because <laughs> – it's effectively going to be what they're going to be interacting with in, in 10 years because this, you know, what's, what's old is new and what's new is old. Mm. And I, I think this paper really um, is showing the elegance of, of pool sizes um, for amino acids because am amino acid biosynthesis is so important and as the bacteria – have their anaplerotic pools and the pools get harvested and how you manage energy charge within the cell. All of these things are are in this complex dynamic. And the endosymbiotes have done the nice, simple binary experiments for us, showing us how, okay, we do this, we get that. And we can separate it with this extra set of, of membranes and how they're segregating their chemistry. So I just found this absolute, this paper was just absolutely remarkable. Uh, want to describe a little bit of the paper itself because we yes. haven't talked about that enough. So let's take the case of tryptophan biosynthesis. Okay, there are about 10 steps in tryptophan biosynthesis. It's complicated, right? It's a complicated molecule. Mm -hmm. So this is how it goes. Tremblea, that's the big guy, makes two of the early precursors. One and two. I won't name it because it doesn't matter. Moranella takes it up, makes the next three, and sends it out to the Tremblea. Tremblea does the next two. <laughs> Moranella does two more and so forth. Five times in a row, the precursors are exchanged between Tremblea and Moranella, Moranella and Tremblea. Now, that is wild. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, it's like, you know, it's like playing ping pong. I mean, they, I, I'll do something, you do something else. We're not, we're not going to let uh, go of this, of this mutual relationship. And then in the end, the mealybug benefits as well. The right? mealybug gets tryptophan, and so do the two endosymbionts, yeah. of course. Yeah. So, um, so how does this happen? So the, there's some speculation here because there's no, it's not obvious that these bugs have the bugs, the bacteria. I gotta be careful here about which is the bug. The bacteria don't <laughs> seem to have decent transport mechanisms. So maybe they're, <clears throat> at least the, the Moranella, the one that's inside, may be very loose and just be able to take up anything. Or, as one hypothesis has it in the paper, maybe the Moranella at some point lyses. Wow and provides its whatever is in it in a soluble form. Nobody knows this. It's, it's difficult to study these things, mind you. You can't really, you know, you, you can't ask this mealybug to present themselves like a test tube. So it's a little bit hard to find out. And it's, it boggles the mind about how often a precursor has to go from one bacterium to another. Just amazing. As I say, this happens also with not nested endosymbionts, but ones where there are two of different kinds inside the same insect. But that's more rare. It, and it's not to this amazing extent. So, you know, just back and forth. Back and forth. The same thing is true for threonine and for some other, other amino acids. They also say that um, for some of these biosynthetic pathways, the Tremblaya and the Moranella don't have all the genes right. that you need, they don't. right? They don't have, neither has a gene for a single complete amino acid pathway. So sometimes the mealybug provides something as oh, well. Oh, yeah. The mealybug gets into the conversation too. It provides some of the precursors as well. So it's a three-way conversation. It's, just, it's amazing. It's weird. It's just really... So uh, it's, it's safe to say that if you removed 
uh, the bacteria site, the mealy bug would die, right? Oh, it die. It would starve to death. Unless it if changes you feed, its... It, uh, it, 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 you can you can do this as an antibiotic assay, yeah. Because you have the, the insect will die; they start to die. Yeah, unless it changes its diet, right? Well, it has to get the tryptophan somehow, and tryptophan, being an aromatic amino acid, is a challenge to get in. Mm-hmm. Right, okay. and and you just can't like phone up the grocery store and say, "Hey, send me some trip." <laughs> <laughs> it's got to come in in the right way, and right. and then. You know, the mealybug is actually converting it to phenylalanine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and so it, it it's really the whole right. aromatic biosynthetic pathway is um, ex- extremely elegant, even in something for which we have a good understanding like E. coli. Um, you know, tryptophan biosynthesis is is tightly regulated with the mechanism that Charlie Yano- Yanofsky and his colleagues worked out uh, with attenuation. Yep. Right. They they well, also um, I don't know if you can comment, Elio, on this. They they talk about the possibility that this is a a recent introduction into the um, mealybug in the last thousands of years, maybe based on the the fact that the genome may be still uh, dynamic. Yeah. Well, uh, right. I mean, that's that's what what it looks like. Uh, but I think isn't that the subject for the second paper? We can, we can discuss. This sure, in we terms can do that. But I mean, the reason I ask is because I want to know. I mean, what came first, mealy bugs with or without the bacteria sites? Well, uh, you you get my guess is that the mealybugs are derived from an insect that could eat other things, mm-hmm. that you know, and then they decide, oh boy, when it comes to sap, we got it all to ourselves. Let's just eat sap, but we got see. a problem, so let's solve the problem. Let's acquire an endosymbiont. I mean, that would be a a way to do it, you know, to start out with something which is yeah. more pluripotent and then whittle it down. And that's the part I like to to speculate on how uh, this happened. Um, well, let's say that a happy insect that eats um, blood, mm-hmm. say a mosquito that is blood sucking. Well, it's complicated because only the females are blood sucking. Let's take some bug that eats complicated food, and suddenly it gets infected with something like a buchnera. Mm-hmm. Okay, and the buchnera is happily there; they're together. Doesn't make make much difference, but the buchnera is making tryptophan. Mm-hmm. And now the insect turns around and says, gee, I don't have to make my tryptophan. Yeah, right. I don't even have to eat blood because not only does it make tryptophan for me, it makes for nine other amino acids. Yeah, yeah, so sure. all of a sudden you forget about how to eat this fancy food and you go to the plants and the sap, which nobody yeah. else is eating. So here's how I would put it. So you, have, you acquire your endosymbiont and for some reason at some point you're stuck and you can't find blood. And okay. you, you have to eat something else, and you and you're selected for. Right. You survive, and then you can propagate because you have these endosymbionts. Right. Does that make yeah. sense? That's I, I think I think you're asking Mother Nature to roll dice with the universe. Uh, to to badly <laughs> paraphrase Einstein, uh, I think what it is more likely to happen is it actually confers um, a fitness benefit because it's much easier to understand how Uh, uh, natural selection will work in a fitness model as opposed to life or death. Because life or death asks asks for a great leap in um, evolution all at once, you know, the punctuated, you know, Mm -hmm. boom. You have the ability to to do something, whereas if it confers fitness, you can see how you can get a gradual increase in fitness. So your genome, in the case of the mealybug, it, with its two endosymbiotes, or its its two symbiotes, actually is then out able to compete its friends and neighbors. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. Thank you for putting me on the right track there. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking too black and white. You know, there's a lot of gray in in this stuff. I looked at Wikipedia, and there are hundreds and hundreds of different mealy bugs. It's amazing. Um, and I wonder if people just looked in most of them, if you would find even more amazing relationships like this. Oh, I, believe, I bet you. I bet you that this story hasn't even, has just barely gotten off the ground. I think that there's going to be a huge variety of 
uh, strategies that are going to be uncovered. But look, look and, if you said to Congress, this is what we are working on, they would probably not get it and take your money away. Yep. So that's the well, danger. It's all about how you ask the question of what's going on. I think some of the most, which is why I brought up the synthetic biologist piece, because I think this whole issue of how you have this cooperative behavior amongst these three independent genomes. It's this cooperation. And I think if you develop your science around the question of, of this cooperation amongst these diverse genomes and then move to the translational aspect of how you can translate this into making whatever you want, some of the complex uh, chemotherapeutic agents that are very difficult and challenging to synth synthesize um, chemically that the microbes know how to do pretty well. I think that's th that was sort of helping me think about rationalizing it. Because like you, Vincent, mm -hmm. I worry about, you know, oftentimes the black and white nature of, of the funding decisions and the funding mores that, that we're facing uh, today. I, I think this is a beautiful, elegant system that really demonstrates well how important um, just investigating something as seemingly simple as mealybugs and how they derive their energy yeah. and their amino acids can lead to something remarkable. I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, Alio, isn't this guy brilliant the way he, the way he oh, puts I'm it? Oh, I'm telling you. And <laughs> Amazing. I'm telling you, because I... I I have a job for you in Washington. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, from from your lips to Congress's ears, uh, we. we <laughs> if 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 I can if I controlled the purse strings and someone said to me, "I want to take every mealy bug I can find and look at them," I would say, "Absolutely, that's a great right. idea." But that's well, you know, absolutely. Look, mitochondria uh, are a source of a lot of diseases. A lot of diseases of humans have to do with the behavior or yeah. misbehavior of mitochondria. To understand mitochondria, I think you have to look at it in a global way. And yeah. this is one way that has to be included. Yeah, you, you guys are great at the grantsmanship, I'm sure. <laughs> well, this is perfect. well ask, your, ask yourself the question, what does this story most closely resemble? And it most closely resembles today metabolic syndrome, where... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, we're eating the wrong stuff is what the, you know, high-level argument is. And, you know, the stuff that we're eating is actually being processed by our food conversion system, which our gut, which is for, which is microbes. And it's, it's causing signaling to go on in our liver, which is resulting in us packing away glucose and making fat. And so if we understand how this mealybug is able to make its energy portfolio balanced. You know, you can figure out drug targets and, and how mm. to mm. dissect out to, to go after something as complex as, as metabolic syndrome. And most of the drugs for metabolic syndrome are nuclear weapons, just like antibiotics are, are nuclear weapons for the microbes. Many of the drugs for uh, metabolic syndrome like metformin are um, nuclear weapons in, in terms of gluconeogenesis and the other things. Yeah. And, and so, which is why they don't have a, as uh, fine structure control as, as you would like that our friends, these endosymbiotes have, have come up with. Yep. Yeah, Elio, is there anything else in this paper we should oh, mention? Oh, I think we probably covered it. I okay. think the next paper is so related to this in some ways, at least, in the general yeah. biological way that we should take it up. The next one is um, a science paper called Rapid Spread of a Bacterial Symbiont in an Invasive White Fly is Driven by Fitness Benefits and Female Bias. And this is another endosymbiont. Michael, what's this one about? This one is... Um very similar to our last story, except it's not as complex from a metabolic perspective. They're actually looking at, at it from the perspective of the population. And so here we have um, a, uh, a white fly, and this particular fly is actually a pest. And the pest 
that or the host that it's attacking is um, sweet potatoes and it also attacks um, other plant species and what these folks noticed is starting in in 2000 a very small fraction of the population of the white fly was uh, co-infected with this uh, species of rickettsia and Rickettsia, as we uh, know, is an obligate intracellular uh, parasite. It has got a reduced genome. And, uh, of course, Rickettsia causes uh, disease in, in man. And it's principally the, the most famous one that I think most folks have heard of is Rocky Mountain uh, Spotted Fever or Typhus, which was, you know, the, uh, the curse of any time humans crowd amongst themselves, like in prisons or prisoner of war camps. They're always worried about um, typhus, and that's why everybody was always running around in those old war movies delousing everyone because it's an arthropod vector base disease. That got Napoleon, and, right? Uh-huh. And absolutely. His, his army. Did it? That's mm. what I understand. Um, from a book actually written by Hans Zinser. Have you read that one? Oh, yeah. All about yeah, but Hans Zinser was famous for his work on rickettsia, so he was plugging them. Yeah, so he they may have been a slight bias there. Yes. He, he was a little biased. <laughs> so back to our rickettsia friends. Um, so the sweet, pota sweet potato whitefly, which is Bessema tabakai, what they learned is that in just six years, You've gone from uninfected white flies to effectively the entire population has this infection with these rickettsia. Now we're going to have to take a digression here and and go off into um, another member of the same family uh, in rickettsia, Wolbachia, and um, Wolbachia is another one of these. Um, uh, symbiotes and um, it also infects arthropods or insects and it's in the same family uh, Rickettsiaceae and Wolbachia is known to cause four phenotypes. Um, the first is when you're infected with Wolbachia and it kills males. The males are principally killed during larval development and again this is a vertically transmitted symbiote. It, it goes from the mother into the egg and so as the males are being developed during larval development uh, you see then an increased rate of female. So it alters that 50-50 sex ratio that we routinely see in multicellular life that um, goes through um, sexual reproduction. The second uh, phenotype that's associated with this infection is feminization. The infected males develop as females or as infertile pseudo-females. The third phenotype, which I find just absolutely remarkable, or um, this is probably how Michael Crichton got the idea in um, Jurassic Park where he had all female dinosaurs and somehow they were able to reproduce. It was probably because they were infected with a Wolbachia-like <laughs> microbe <laughs> because you laugh, but you know now we can explain Michael Crichton and he's no longer with us to explain himself. And the, the, this one bacterium, Wolbachia, which is in this family of Rickettsia, is able to allow females to, re to make offspring without the introduction of sperm. So this is really remarkable. And then the final uh, phenotype that's associated with this microbe is cytoplasmic incompatibility, where Wolbachia infected males, the ones that actually do indeed develop, they cannot successfully reproduce with uninfected females or naive females that don't have an infection. So this is really remarkable if you want to begin to think about controlling arthropods like mosquitoes. Y if, you, if you were able to make um, get enough males that had Wolbachia and then you turn them loose, you could effectively wipe out uh, females because they or wipe out that species wipe out a particular disease that's transmitted by arthropods, like, for example, uh, dengue or even something like malaria. Yep. 
Uh, this is being this is being studied quite intensively. People are really trying to do that on a, on a field uh, trial basis. So oh, this absolutely. is not yeah. uh, very far fetched. This is very yeah. close to to reality. And the reason I'm introducing this now is to highlight to to the folks listening that what we're going to describe in the paper today is just looking at the transformation of a population. All of these phenotypes, and there's one more I forgot to mention that Vincent brought up to me, is it also confers the ability of the host, the insect, to resist viruses. Right. Yep. And I would like to send the listeners to This Week in Virology number 147. The whole episode we talked about Wolbachia and uh, its use in trying to control dengue. It's a really interesting story. So that ends the digression about Wolbachia and the wonders that this microbe's genomes can actually inflict on a host. So now back. Hey, can to you our- st- can you stand one more digression? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Okay, now um, rickettsia. Since you brought up rickettsia, uh, there is the following question: Why is it that vertebrates do not have obligate endosymbionts? They don't seem to. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can look high, far and wide and nobody knows except for one situation, which is in fact uh, what happens when people get infected with typhus and recover. They come down with a mild form of typhus 30, 40 years later called Brill's disease. And Brill's disease looks like the recrudescence, that is the arising of a rickettsia that's been inside your body all the time. And since rickettsia grow intracellularly, it qualifies, I would guess, as a long-term benevolent, because the the disease is not that bad, and um, long-range endosymbiosis of a vertebrate. Hmm. But we do have an endosymbiont. We have a mitochondria, right? Ah, absolutely, yeah. It's just absolutely. further along then. Anyhow, this anyway. is really a digression. And, uh, anyhow. But I think all of these digressions really set the stage, and, and we brought it up earlier about trying to justify s- studying something as seemingly mm. um, simple as uh, an invasion of a white fly by a, by a microbe. That is, And the story that we're going to discuss here today is relatively straightforward. In 2000, you had a population of white flies that had no rickettsia. These were in the southwest U.S., right? Southwestern United States. And presently, today, the entire population is infected with this species of rickettsia. Now, there's a similar story going on in Israel. And the rickettsia have not yet been able to take over the Israeli white flies. And that may be because the Israeli white flies are just a little bit more uh, resistant or the rickettsia haven't been able to figure out how to provide that level of fitness to convert the entire population. So now we're going to go through the story here. So we know from our friends Wolbachia that um, this symbiosis is transmitted vertically as opposed to the traditional way many of us think about infections of acquiring it horizontally from another, um, in this case, insect. So you actually are acquiring this infection from your mother. And the first experiment that these folks did is um, they asked the question, how fast can it spread in a population? And this is what really blew my mind, is that this white fly has 13 generations a year. 13 generations of a year. And so if that was in humans, this would be the equivalent of 260 years to get 13 generations. So you're now looking at the scale that we can ask the question of how these things move through the community. So their their experiment that they did in the lab is they did five whitefly generations, which is less than a third of a year. And they grew the flies on, on um, three different plants, cotton, melon, and cowpea. And when they started, 14% of the hosts were infected. And then they asked the question, how quickly it spread? And they did um, 
something called a walled test, which is a variation of, of chi-square to ask whether or not it was indeed spread. And what they learned is that um, it was basically vertically transmitted, just like our friend uh, Wolbachia is, is transmitted. And uh, what they also saw is that um, horizontal transmission from males to females, again, very similar to our friends Wolbachia, did, did not occur. And so, again, this is arguing for a very similar behavior to what we are seeing with the Wolbachia. So it, it's, it's, it's really um, pretty interesting in that it's um, vertically spread. And so... Could I interject? Yes, please. I just want to point out how these are done because for me it's totally different. They have a, a plant growing in a cage and they put the flies in and then the flies lay eggs. They mate and lay eggs. And then they take the adults out and the, the eggs hatch, and they check them for the rickettsia, and they keep doing this for generation and generation. Hmm. It's, it's a really neat experiment. And they check by PCR for the for the rickettsia. Right. And the way they do the PCR is they literally grind everything up, and yeah. the beauty of PCR is DNA is DNA. They harvest the DNA and ask who's there. Yep. So, um, again, they um, ask the question, uh, you know, does this – is spread in the field and the answer again was in the affirmative and it's it's spreading pretty quickly and uh, so then they ask um, the and they asked a series of question uh, whether the what effect the infection on the white fly had on its fertility its survival and its sex ratio and Again, finding a very similar behavior to what we see with Wolbachia. Males were killed during larval development because you saw a skewing of uh, the sex ratio where you got more females. And again, because this is a vertically transmitted uh, infection, you can begin to see how this can very quickly um, spread amongst the members of this population because it is a population effect that they are measuring say it again uh, michael i think this is such a crucial point about why this happens that you you ought to dwell on it for a, a second more just say the same things you did and uh, we listen okay what's the the effect of of uh rickettsia on these various parameters what are they right right okay um that's figure three Yes, figure three. In figure three, they ask a, a series of questions of what infection uh, will have on the white fly. And they had two experimental groups. They had the ones that were infected and the ones that were not infected. So the way they refer to them as rickettsia plus or R plus or R minus. And so they asked three questions about fecundity, which is, you know, how well they are are reproducing, uh, their survival rate, and then their sex ratio. And so they referred to these as the life history parameters, and they were growing these white flies on the cow pea leaf disc in the same manner that uh, Vincent described earlier. And so the mean adult progeny produced per female after a three-day oviposition period uh, and their results were uh, statistically significant. You can see that the mean adult progeny per female were much higher than they were in the rickettsia minus or the uninfected uh, white flies, mm -hmm. which a I good, find... A good factor of two, right? It's yeah. a good factor of two, yes. Yeah. And their percent survival to adulthood, which is effectively the gold standard for fitness. And their percent survival to adulthood, hmm. again, this is uh, panel B, their percent survival to adulthood was, again, statistically significant. 80% um, percent of the infected ones, or about 80%, percent, survived to adulthood while less than 50%, if I'm reading the figure correctly, yep. uh, survived to adulthood that were not infected. And then when they asked the question, how many of the 
offspring in the infected population were uh, female, again, it's well over 80%. And, you know, the dogma that we're taught about sexual reproduction is you always want 50-50. And here it's over 80% of the population was female, while in the uninfected it was about 60%. And so, again, looking at all of these things, and this is looking at um, mean adult progeny. So I, I'm looking at the adult one. But similarly, if you look at the mean juvenile progeny per 20 females, they go in and they elegantly show that the results are effectively the, – the, the graphs, for all intents and purposes, look pretty similar to each other. Mm, it's amazing. And it's, it's um, a, a remarkable story – that, again, these symbiotes are having such a complex interaction with the host they're living in, and they're able to influence um, something as profound as reproduction. Because reproduction is not one of those things you would think we could tinker with a lot and still have a species. And so – you really are probably all scratching your heads now saying, how does the rickettsia do this? Yep. That's and, the question. <laughs> and the answer is, well, we don't know yet. <laughs> um, there's there's three um, hypotheses that the authors uh, put forward. Uh, manipulation of the plant quality. And plant quality can dramatically change white fly performance. And again, it's going back into a, a fitness argument. And they can also be... Uh, right, well, hold on. I, I had a hard time with understanding what plant quality is. Can you explain that? Uh, I can try, but I'm not an ecologist. And so this whole notion of plant quality was uh, a struggle for me as well. And... Let me see if I can find the right passage. And um, unfortunately, they don't give any details. They don't. They don't really tell you much. It just says that. That's why I asked. Yeah. I, I was hoping. <laughs> and I looked in I was, the supplemental information to try to find the plant quality, and it may be what the white fly is actually doing to the cowpea disc, and it says um, cowpea which was Vigna ungulataria, uh, which is a variation California black eye, was used for white fly culturing, leaf disc, and most whole plant experiments. And they just give a, a very brief uh, description of what's actually going on. So I honestly don't know. I assume it's it's obtaining nutrition from it. And that was the only um, concept that um, – I could think about that. The other thing is that the rickettsia could serve as a nutritional mutualist. That is, again, very similar to what we discussed in the last paper, where you have this ping pong effect where the rickettsia are gets, getting something from the host or the host, and then the host is then supplying something back to the rickettsia. And that could be something that could be tested given the methods from the last paper. Or the final one, um, which is also possible, and again it goes back to our phenotypes associated with Wolbachia for which there's a wider body of, of literature out there, is that it could be a defensive mutualist where the infected uh, host is actually protected from cryptic pathogens from the rickettsia itself. And these cryptic pathogens are present in the field, whether they be viruses or they, whether they be um, bacteria or even fungi for that matter. Though I don't know whether or not the rickettsia have been shown to stave off fungal or bacterial attacks to the same level and extent that they can stave off uh, the viruses. And um, the other thing that they um, argue is that the rickettsia infected white flies uh, develop faster. And so if you're um, a larval form uh, subject to predation, it would be to your advantage to get to the adult stage much more quickly 
Um, so you could, um, you know, go to the next generation. Hmm. And this is where they bring up the story about what's going on with the Israeli variant of um, this particular um, symbiosis that has been going on. And the Israeli white flies um, have much lower infection rates uh, in the field, and they have been studied for a similar amount of time, and it has not yet taken over um, the population. So the basic summary of the paper is you have host reproduction being manipulated by an infection with this rickettsia. It's vertically transmitted, and you skew the reproduction so that you get um, many more females, over 80% females, as opposed to the base rate, which is about 60% uh, females. And this larger fitness benefit is um, associated with this single symbiotic uh, lineage that they're seeing in this um, system. So I thought this was, again, one of these very provocative stories that can help us understand something that has more of a complete genome. So this um, the sampling they did in the southwest U.S. showed that um, it went f- the rickettsial uh, infections went from 1% in 2000 to 97% in 2006. So this seems to be a, a relatively recent event, at least in that part of the world. What do you think stimulated that? You think it has to do with farming, the increase in, in crops, and that selected for the presence of the rickettsia? It could be something as simple as uh, the monoculture mm-hmm. of our agriculture mm-hmm. system. Yeah. Um, yeah you know, there, many of the or- people doing organic farming are arguing against the monoculture nature of American farming. You know, we effectively grow corn, soybeans in bulk. Yeah. <laughs> and not much of anything else. Yeah. You know, I hate to say this, but doesn't this sound like treating the uh, crops with antibiotics might be a way to get rid of the white flies? <laughs> <laughs> uh, literally, I think what will happen is you will select out. And that's maybe what's going on in Israel. They may actually have um, other microbes in those fields that may be producing yeah. natural antibiotics that are keeping the rickettsia in check yeah. and preventing them. Of course, them from- last, in Chicago, you heard why feeding antibiotics to cattle may not be such a good idea. Oh, now yeah. you want to feed it to the plant. No, I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> but I'm afraid yeah, well, someone will I'm get kidding. the idea, right? Um, you know, if the farmers find that they can use it to uh, get rid of white flies, they may. Hmm. That would be a big problem. Then we get even more resistance as if we don't have enough right now right that's very yeah, cool. it's 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 pretty spooky it's it's pretty spooky to see what's actually going on but again if it teaches us how to maybe control um some of these pests that are out there like the the mosquitoes carrying malaria malaria or dengue so much the better yeah you want to hear another case of where endosymbionts matter sure there's an eye disease called Loa Loa, I think it is, ah, caused by a filaria, yeah. a worm. And that worm carries bacteria in it. And the disease to the eye is due to the lipopolysaccharide carried by the bacteria. Wow. You, treat, yes. you treat it with antibiotic. The worm doesn't care, but the disease goes away. <laughs> so it shows you how humans are infected, are affected by yeah. endosymbionts of worms in this case, as well as of insects. Amazing. It's just amazing, yeah. and it's more extensive than we can imagine, I'm Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. So our friends at the NSF and NIH, if you're listening, <laughs> uh, there are many interesting topics out there that warrant investigation. Yeah, and they may not seem obvious at first glance, but you can find out a whole lot just by searching. Okay, I'd like to... Before we go on and read a few email, I want to acknowledge the support of this episode of TWIM by Wiley Blackwell, a leading scientific publisher of books, scholarly journals, major reference works, and databases. This month, they're offering 25% off of all of their microbiology and virology books. To take advantage, go to wiley.com go 
slash microbe world. That's wiley.com slash go slash microbe world. And you can see their wonderful collection of microbiology and virology books and take 25% off. We thank Wiley Blackwell for their support of This Week in Microbiology. Our first email is from Marco, who is from Griefswald in Germany. Thanks a lot for this great podcast. I'm already listening to podcasts several hours a day. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. And until now, the science component was missing a bit. However, now with Twim, Twip, and Twiv in my feet, I think I have to go for an extra walk with my dog every day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a German student of Masters of Geosciences and Environment and wrote my bachelor's thesis about the influence of microbicides to microorganisms in a local wastewater treatment plant. Maybe wastewater treatment could be an interesting topic for a TWIM episode. As far as I know, there is still little known about the consortia in activated sludge. Wow. You, does anyone know anything about that? No, but I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to learn. We'll have to find fascinating. Do you know someone who could talk about that, Michael? My senior technician, her husband is actually associate it runs the local sewage treatment plant wow and Ooh. he he tells uh rather interesting stories that would be fun i'd like to get someone on who could talk about this it would be good absolutely and he writes i enjoy listening to you guys so much keep up the great all the best from griefswald thank you marco our next email is from mary your collaborator alio Yep. She writes, I've been listening to the evolution of TWIM week by week and want to say that I am delighted by the direction it has gone. I listened to number 11 yesterday and found the format especially informative and interesting. By format, I am referring to the selection of, in this case, two papers, both of which were introduced well to orient the listener to the context and the topic. In each case, there followed a real discussion among the co-hosts that was accessible to listeners with varied backgrounds, acronyms, and specialized terms were defined or replaced by more common words. As if that weren't enough, the viewpoints presented this week were particularly relevant and important vis-a-vis -vis our microbiota, allergies, antibiotic usage, agricultural practices, and such. This information needs to be widely disseminated, and TWIM makes an excellent contribution to that process. Carry on. Hey, way to go, Mary. Thank you. I don't know. I think sometimes we uh, don't define everything, but we're pretty good about it. But thank you, Mary. And our last email today is from Varun, who writes, I'm a microbiologist from India, and I find your podcast very interesting. The very education and the fun you bring is awesome. I have a suggestion. I'm wondering why you wouldn't start doing this week in mycology. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Vincent. I would also like to acknowledge that I and my students at times sit together to listen to the podcast and put our own ideas and open discussions in class. So microbiology is more fun now than it was before. Once again, thank you for great work. Good luck for your future episodes. I think this week in mycology, we'll have to wait <laughs> till I'm <laughs> retired. <laughs> well, actually, we, we can actually begin to, we had a paper um, w that we did at the last TWIM uh, that Arturo discussed, you know, the fungal hypothesis, and we can be more, yeah. you know, we can pull in some fungi. And uh, two twims ago, Ilio brought up that wonderful topic. Uh, we did um, the cryptococcus story. That's right. So we, we've been weaving in some mycology. Both of those, by the way, from Arturo Casa de Val. That's right. Yes. That's right. But yeah, we'll, well, we got to get him. We will weave in more fungi. And then, Elio, yeah, you will be happy about that, right? I'd be delighted. I want to sprout like mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah, we'll bring it. Well, we don't have to have a separate podcast, but we can do more mycology. And I would love to because I would learn because I know very little about those wonderful fungi. You can find TWIM at iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace. If you do go to those places, why don't you subscribe and automatically get each new episode as they come out on iTunes. If you're new to TWIM, leave a comment. It helps us to stay on the front page of the podcast section over there. You can go over to microbeworld.org slash app and 
find an app for your Android device or iPhone, which allows you to stream the episodes. We always like to get your comments and questions. Send them to twim at twiv.tv or go over to microworld.org slash twim, where you can also leave a comment. I want to thank everyone for participating today. Michael Schmidt from the Medical University of South Carolina. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Vincent and Elio. It was a great show again. And Elio Schechter at Small Things Considered. Thank you. Oh, always fun. Thank you so much. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank ASM for supporting TWIM, Communications Director Barbara Hyde, and Chris Condian and Ray Ortega for their organizational and technical help. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.